Marni God is good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, is anyone seeing, as we go through the book of Ephesians, is anyone seeing actual action steps to take, faith steps to take to walk this out? Or are you just reading it? Can you see anything to actually implement in your lives? Even if it's revelation knowledge of who you are in Christ seated in heavenly places. Right? You see yourself that way every morning. Come on. The devil doesn't even get a look in. So it's, it's getting the revelation because we live by the, by the word of God, the revelation, the rima that comes from God. And when you get that rima that comes out of the book of Ephesians for you every week, when you get that and you make that a part of your life and you seal that in your life by the power of the Holy Ghost and you live it out, you actually become transformed more and more into the image of Christ. It's awesome. And so when you establish yourself in things like the books of Ephesians, um, you know, other books of doctrine in the book and then books of reproof and correction, whatever it might be, you establish yourself in the revelation, not in the head knowledge, not in the intellectualism, not in the analytical or the hermeneutical or anything else, but you establish yourself in the revelation that the Holy Spirit gives to you, your life is transformed because your mind is being renewed. It's awesome. I love the book of Ephesians. And just when I think that's my favourite, and think, oh no, I really love Colossians, and oh, I really love, you know, it's just that every time you open the Bible, you are having a relationship with Jesus Christ, the living Word of God. It's not just words printed on a book, on paper, it is Jesus. He is the living Word. And the, the thing that makes the difference is when you plant the seed of the Word of God in your heart. When you actually take that scripture and you start to dig it into the soil of your heart, you start to plant the seed, and that's when you find that you'll get a harvest. That's when the fruit will come. That's when you become fruitful because the revelation breaks forth. And remember what I said last week, maybe you don't remember, <laughs> but in every revelation, there is a key to victory. So every revelation you get, you steward it, you, you mull over it, you allow it to become flesh encased in your flesh so that you can't be separated from it. When you just know that you know that you know. Like for me, Colossians 1.9, I know that I'm filled with the knowledge of the will of God and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I can't be talked out of it. I might make wrong decisions, but I know that I'm filled with the knowledge of His will. I just know it because it became a revelation and I stewarded the revelation and I planted the seed of the Word of God in my heart and then it became, started to bring forth fruit, first the, the blade, then the ear, then the full head of corn. You know, it comes up that way. And so knowing the Word of God from an intellectual aspect does not bring life. There is no life in intellectual knowledge. It might be no eternal life, no transformational life. There might be, oh my gosh, that's interesting information. And you can live it out to a certain point, but then somebody will come with an, with an argument about it, or something will happen, and you go back to a default setting. You go back to what you believed before that came, because it's just for intellect. It's just in your soul. We need to learn to live from our spirit. Yeah? So it's, you know, and I think one of the reasons that I, I'm frustrated, but not frustrated. Can I say that? I'm frustrated with my life and I'm frustrated with what I'm seeing in the body of Christ, generally speaking, in that we seem to be poorer and sicker than the people in the world. How come? How come? Or we're unemployed or, you know, we're struggling with this and we're struggling with that when Jesus Christ has paid the full Christ of redemption. So one of the reasons for that is that we have not established the Word of God as a seed in our hearts. We're not living out of revelation. We're, or we're, we might be living out of Joyce Meyer's revelation or Joseph Prince's revelation or somebody else's revelation and we've studied it and we can see what they're, what they're saying and we agree with it. That's still not our revelation. And when you consider Genesis 39 verses 1 to 3 that Joseph was a successful, prosperous man who was a slave. Joseph was a slave. 
Slaves have no rights. Slaves don't have any material assets. Slaves are told when to go to bed, when to get up, what to do. They have absolutely no rights. And yet Genesis chapter 39 verse 3 says that he was a successful, prosperous man, depending on what translation that you get. But he was successful and he was prosperous. How can a slave be successful and prosperous? It's just not intellectually possible, is it? It's just no way. It's like saying, you know, because and I would read that as a single mum with, with the children that I had, and I would say, and I would I'd come back to that verse and I'd say, God, I am a divorced woman with, with six children, and I claim what Joseph had, that I will be as successful and as prosperous as he was, so will I be, simply because the Lord was with him. That was the key to his elevation. It was the key to him being promoted in everything that he did. Even when he was chucked in jail because of false accusation, he was still promoted. Why was he promoted? Because he had a relationship with God that trans but transcended his situation and his circumstance. The Lord was with him, relationship. The Lord was with him. That meant they talked, they dialogued, they the Lord was with him as he was a slave. The Lord was with him right in the midst of his circumstances. And because the Lord was with him, covenant promise, covenant power, covenant everything, he prospered. He was successful. So we have no excuse. New Testament, no excuse. And just as the Lord was with Joseph, even more so is the Lord with us. Yeah? Even more so. So how amazing is this? That regardless of situations and circumstances, simply because we have a relationship with an almighty God and we live according to the revelation of his word, we prosper, we're successful. Every weapon that formed against us, and there were weapons formed against Joseph, were overturned. And, and in that accusation where he was chucked in prison, that was a divine positioning to come in front of Pharaoh so that he could then be promoted to governor of, of the whole country. So one of the things that we need to be walking through the, at the Lord through things is to be asking for future wisdom. Joseph had future wisdom. He knew what was going to come. He knew that, hey, there's going to be a famine. This is going to happen. So, But he didn't just say, this is what is going to happen. He also said, here's the solution. Here's what you do about it. Here's the logistics. You know, like, amazing that they ran out of places to hold it. They stopped counting the amount of food that they stored away. But it came from one phrase in Genesis 39, verse 3, the Lord was with him. So as we spend time in Ephesians, as we spend time getting into the Word of God and allowing the Word to get into us, we're going to be walking in that same kind of relationship. We're going to be walking in intimacy with Him. And you are going to find that you will prosper and you will be successful and transformation will come. And there will be change of directions for some of you. There will be a dropping off of some other things. And there will be a picking up of new things. But there will be a change because you're putting the Word first. Jesus is first. And you're digging into it like a miner digs in a mine looking for that gold. And I've just finished reading a book called Three Feet. Is it Three Feet from Gold? Three Feet from Gold. Uh, and a true story about a man back in the 1920s, I think, found a, a vein of gold, like a rich vein of gold. This is awesome. So he's mining the gold and he's becoming very rich and then all of a sudden it dries out. There's no more gold. So he just sells the land and figures, oh, well, I've got what I could out of it. He sold the land. But somebody else bought it and they came in with engineers and um, engineers, geologists. And they actually found that all he had to do was move three feet in a certain direction and there was a bigger vein of gold, a richer vein of gold than what he had been mining. So he was three feet short of gold. One meter. He just had to do a little bit of a, a redirection, a recalibration, you know, like the GPS is always telling me turn right now. Do a U-turn, do a U-turn, because I didn't listen or whatever. But he was, he was one metre short, just one metre. 
But what he did was he learnt from that. He didn't go away and think, ah, oh. he actually went away and applied that diligence and following things through to a new, new business and he made a lot of money in a new field. So what I'm saying is we don't want to pull up short. We don't want to stop mining in the Word of God because we're not seeing instant change. It takes time. There are all kinds of soil, all kinds of mind that we have. Once that hard path, you know, where the, the seed can't even make an impression, where the seed can't even be planted in. And then there's the one with the weeds. And then there's the one that gets everything soaked up because it all a stony ground. And then there's the weeds. And then there's the good soil. So in some areas of my life, I am good soil. In other areas of my life, it's a bit choked. I need to keep weeding it. In other areas of my life, it's a bit of stony ground. And in some areas, it's a beaten path and there's just no way the seed is going in just yet. So I've got, to, I've got to break through the ground. I've got to dig it up. So if we've all got different areas. For some, for some of us, it's easy to be prosperous. For some of us, it's easy to stay in help. For others, it's a challenge. But it comes back to the state of our heart and the state of our mind. So as we're digging into the Word of God and as we're, we're, we're planting that seed of, of the Word of God in our heart, that incorruptible seed, it's, a, it's making mind changes. It's, it's making new, what do you call those neurons? Me, neuron things in the head, you know, the neuron things. Dr. Gleef talks about them all the time. But you know, it, it changes us. And one of the things that would, I think a lot of Christians are frustrated and fed up. I love the fed up anointing. When that fed up anointing hits, man, does change happen in my life? Yes, I am fed up. I'm not going to put up with this another second. And so I, I make drastic change and I head in a different direction because I will not tolerate this another second. It does not line up with the Word of God. I am fed up. And so that anointing hits me and change comes. And I love it because nothing else seems to kick my butt into gear like that fed up anointing. And, and that's when I'll pull away and I'll spend six, eight hours a day in the Word because I've got to renew my mind. I've got to change my view. I've got, to, I've got to shift my focus. I've got to do things differently. I need to do an audit on me by the Holy Spirit to see what needs to change. Why am I in this situation? Why can't I get out of it? What's keeping me here? What, what's the anti-breakthrough spirit that's at work in my life? Because there are anti-breakthrough spirits. And if you're not getting a breakthrough, it could be because there's an anti-breakthrough. Because God, Satan does not want you to fulfill your destiny. He does not want you to line up with God's book for your life. And so when we start to step into that, he starts to come in and make things a bit cloudy. And that's when we've got to be focused and purposeful and diligent and just digging into Jesus and the Holy Ghost because nothing else works. Nothing else works. So Bob worships, and she's got a beautiful voice, and she loves to worship, and that's her, that's her thing. But mine is the Word, and I worship when I'm in the Word, and I pray my way through the Word. So just having a look at Ephesians chapter 2, I personalize it, and I... Ephesians 2. Starting in verse 4. I personalize it and I speak like this, but God, I love the but gods. But God, so rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loves me. Even when I was dead in trespasses, he made me alive together with Christ. By grace I've been saved. And God has raised me up together with Christ. And he's made me sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward me in Christ Jesus. Father, I just want to thank you for the exceeding riches of your grace. I want to thank you, Father, that you've raised me up, that you've seated me with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. I want to thank you, Father, that I was saved by grace through faith. I thank you, Father, works has got nothing to do with it. I just want to praise you. And so I take the scriptures and I pray the scriptures and I personalize them and I make it a prayer unto God. And that's, that's one of the ways that works for me. So I pray it in and I thank God for it and I just... I just worship him that, you know, I'm no longer a stranger. God, I just want to thank you. I'm no longer a stranger. Verse 19. 
but I'm a fellow citizen with the saints. I'm a member of the household of God. Father, I want to thank you that you've built me on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. I want to thank you that Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone of my life. I want to thank you that I'm a part of the whole building that's being fitted together, growing into a holy temple in you. And I want to thank you that I am being built together with the body of Christ into a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. So we take the scriptures and we pray it through and we personalize it and we make it our own. So, you know, whatever version you love, whatever version, you know, whether it's passion, whether it's voice, whether it's new living, whether it's King James, whatever passion you, or translation, parent, whatever it is that, that gets you excited, yeah, I love this. Pray it through. Take this, these chapters and pray it through. So the exciting thing about Ephesians chapter 3 is that in Ephesians chapter 1, the prayer was about what Paul wanted you to know. There were three things he wanted you to know. But in Ephesians chapter 3, there are three things he wants you to have. And so I love this about Paul. The first part of the chapter is all about the doctrine. The second part of the chapter is the prayer. So, okay, this is, this is what you have. This is what's working in your life. This is what God's doing. But now let's pray it into your life. And so he takes what he said in the first part of the chapter and he turns it into a prayer and he prays it over us. And so in Ephesians chapter 3, he wants you to have some things. He wants you to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in your inner man. And that's not talking about your spirit, because your spirit's perfect. Your spirit doesn't need strengthening. Your spirit is one with Christ. You are, your, your spirit is perfect. It's, it's your inner man. It's your personality, your character. It's your soul, your will, your mind, your emotions. It's all of that. And he's saying, I want to strengthen your character. I want to strengthen your soul. I want to strengthen your willpower. I want to strengthen your the way your mind works. I want to strengthen you in your inner man, in the parts that make you you. I want to strengthen that by the power of the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine? That's why you can stand. When you've been strengthened by the Holy Spirit and the inner man, that's when you can stand, having done all stand. Doesn't matter who comes against you, doesn't matter who says what about you, you can stand because you've been strengthened by the Holy Spirit and the inner man. Nothing can shake you. You are unshakable. We should be unshakable citizens in an unshakable kingdom because we serve an unshakable king. And so this, this uh, 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 what do you call it, stability, whatever it is, but it comes from the strengthening of the Holy Spirit. So as you go through the book of Ephesians, look at the number of times that the Holy Spirit is mentioned. Look at what he's doing in your life. Look at the times it says, according to the power that works in us. So in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, depending on your translation, I've got a new King James. This one says, with this reason... I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for this reason. And then he wants to go on and explain about some things. But he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. I might be a prisoner in Rome. I'm in bondage writing this letter. But my true, I've been captivated by Christ. Christ has captured my heart. He's captured my life. I am Christ's captive. Have you been captivated by Jesus? Have you been captivated by him? And it's not about your gift. It's not about what you want. It's not about where you go. It's not about anything but Jesus. Is he more real to you than the person sitting next to you? Can you see him walking through life with you? He's always on my right side. He's always there. He's always. Sometimes he's Jesus. Sometimes it's the, the, the lion of Judah that's padding alongside of me. Sometimes it, it might be something, but he's always there. He's always with me. Because that's his name, Emmanuel. God with us. How awesome is this? So he, Paul says, I start this off by saying, you know what? I'm a prisoner. Not a Rome. They might not have me in jail. But I'm a prisoner of Christ. So right there, he's establishing a relationship that's a challenge. Because are we just churchgoers? Or are we captivated by Jesus? Is he more real to us than anybody, anything else in our life? Right there, he throws down the gauntlet. 
I'm not talking, he said, he's saying, I'm, 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 he was in bondage, he was in chains in Rome writing this letter. But he says, that's, that's not the chain. I'm, in, I'm enslaved to Christ. I'm his love slave. I belong to him. He's, he's, Rome's got nothing to do with my physical, um, external life, where I am, what I'm going through. It's nothing compared to the fact that Christ has captured my heart and taken hold of my life. How awesome is that? So he starts off saying, for this reason. And then, and then he goes on and he talks about the number of things. And then it goes down in verse 14 and he says, for this reason. So he connects the, the theme there. He connects the flow of the chapter. But it's also a division because one is, one is doctrine and one is prayer. For this reason, this is the doctrine I want you to know. For this reason, this is the prayer I'm going to pray. And this is what I want you to have. Is this making sense? So I have look for the things that are repeated. Um, I'm trying to find it, but there's, there's one place there where it talks about the power. So there's a number of times where power is used in Ephesians chapter 3. So look for the repeats. And for me, it's the little phrases. It's the little phrases, like for this reason. Um, that's mentioned a couple of times. When we start chapters 4, 5, and 6, the word walk is used in different ways throughout those chapters. So it's the, for me, it's the little phrases. And when you see things like, um, as it is, as it was in the days of Noah, so it is, not that this is Ephesians, but this is just something. As it was, so it is. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. You see it all the way through Proverbs. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. So you can see it all the way through Proverbs. When you see therefore, what is the reason therefore is there for? So these are the little things that you look up and, 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 and look for. What's the theme going through? Like in Matthew, you know, it starts off talking about um, Emmanuel, Jesus. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. And then in Matthew 28, Jesus says, and I will be with you always. There's the full circle. It comes back to the very beginning again. So there's a flow and there's a theme in the books of the, in the, books of the Word. And Ephesians is beautiful because Ephesians says that you know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says that we were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sins. But Jesus Christ, verse 6, but God, He rescued us from our bondage. He set us free. He paid the price. So that might be who I was, but it's not who I am. I am completely different. I'm completely separated from that person. So the first thing that we see is that we are in bondage. We were dead. So that bondage now as Christians could be ill health. It could be um, lack of finances, lack of employment, whatever it might be. It might be there's no real stability in your life. So the thing is, in, in our life, well, because we're Christians, doesn't mean that we don't have opportunities for stuff to go wrong. But it does mean we have the way out. So the first thing is bondage. And that's what we saw in Ephesians 2.1. And then out of that, we've got but God. So we've got rescue. He rescues us. And this is, this is a challenge. And I'm going to, uh, this, this is a challenge because I'm speaking to a businessman during the week who are, man, going down the debt escalator so fast it's horrifying. And every day they're struggling just to pay the debt which is interest upon, you know, and more debt, and the shops are running, the shops are dying, and the shopping centre's dying, and they can't see any way to turn it around. So they're in bondage, and they need God to come in with rescue. But the thing is, God has promised to rescue us. He's promised. That's what covenant is all about. Whatever you need, I'll give it to you. I'll meet your every need according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This is covenant, whatever your need is. So if we, because we know, everyone in this room knows you are born again, right? Born again? Can anyone talk you out of it? Okay, so when we were born again, we accepted what Jesus did at the cross. Can I ask a question? Why did we not also receive the truth of healing? that by his stripes we were healed. Because we still think we've got to jump through hoops to get that, when it's a done deal. 
We still think, well, maybe I haven't prayed enough, maybe I'm not praying in the right way, you know, the pain's still there, so obviously I'm not healed. That, that's going by feelings, not going by faith. So it was, it was done as sure as you were saved. The same certainty with which you were saved is the same certainty with which God gave you divine health. Except we get doctor's reports, we get pains in our body, and it is not as sure and certain to us as our salvation. The same with poverty. Poverty was destroyed at the cross. And Jesus gave us his riches. And that's not just spiritual riches. In the Hebrew, in the Greek, it is not spiritual riches. It is financial prosperity. So we're not as sure of our health and our prosperity as we are of our salvation. We allow our peace to be stolen. When Jesus said, I'll give you my peace. I'll give it to you. But we allow it to be taken because it's not as sure to us as our salvation. Your salvation is not about getting born again and going to heaven. Your salvation incorporates and encompasses healing, wholeness, prosperity, wisdom, um, rescue, um, being safe and sound, being set free. All of these is it making sense? And so when this is something that we see in the book of Ephesians, we were in a mess. And yet God came along and he paid the price of redemption and rescued us. And so when I prayed for the, the businessman this week, you know, like, but God has promised to give you a way out. He'll never give you anything more than he will. He's promised a way out. He took your poverty at the cross. All you've got to do is repent of getting into debt and then allow him the, the, the chance to repent. He's going by his bank accounts. He's going by his feelings. He's going by all of these things. And he's being talked out of the very promises of God by the circumstances that are in his life. Instead of us commanding the circumstances to leave because of the promises of God. Yeah? Does this make sense? So in the book of Ephesians, this is all laid out for us. And so we're rescued. And in that rescue... There's deliverance. That's what covenant is. God says, it doesn't matter what you get into, I'll get you out of it. doesn't matter how much debt you run up, I'll pay for it. In covenant, God has given us, with Jesus Christ, He has given us everything. But in that same covenant, we have to give Him everything. Which is good news for us, because we can give Him the money that we owe. God, I've got these debts. So according to covenant, I'm laying these debts at your feet. And I'm taking hold of your provision and I thank you for it. I'm giving you my sickness and disease and I'm taking hold of the divine health that you've given me. That's what covenant is all about. We give, whether it's positive or negative, we give. Hey, listen, I've got this in my life, God. And according to covenant, you said you'd fix it. It's pretty simple. It really is simple. But there's so many points to this and seven steps to that. And goodness, it's just Jesus. And, and what he has given us. So salvation is the whole package. So we were in bondage, but then God comes, and with the rescue, the redemption comes deliverance. And what that does when we are delivered, that means that we live his original intent for our life. We go back to the book, Psalm 139, verse 15, I think it is. We go back to that. We go back to the fact that, um, you know, he saved us for good works before the very foundation of the earth. So these good works, the original intent that he had for our life was already there. And all we have to do is, God, I am in a mess. So when you take communion, when you read the word, God, I'm in a mess and I'm in bondage. Jesus Christ came to set me free from bondage. I receive your rescue and your deliverance. Your redemption has been paid in full. And I am now, because I have laid the debt, I've laid the sickness, I've laid the situation, I have laid the whatever it is that's making you uncomfortable, that's causing you grief, I've laid it at your feet. And now I take hold of my life. And I thank you that you will line up with original intent. And I will no longer live my life um, using the compass of my circumstances and situations, but I'm going to use the compass of the book of life that you wrote about me. I'm going to use the compass of Jesus to live out my life. Is this making sense? You're with me? 
So this is what Ephesians is all about. This is what communion is all about. We've got to come back to the original intent of his, of his plan for our lives. It was Moody, I think, who was brought to the Lord by a shoe salesman. And if a shoe salesman, I think it was Moody, if a shoe salesman had not brought him to the Lord when he went in to buy a pair of shoes, we might never have had a Moody. That brought amazing revelation to the body of Christ. We've got, to, we've got to be positioned where God wants us positioned. The lady I talked about last week, Henrietta Mears, with over 400 people that came out of her ministry that affected the world for good. You know, um, Lauren Cunningham, Bill Bright, the Campus Crusade, um, Billy Graham. If she had not been a Sunday school teacher at that Presbyterian church in Hollywood, none of those people would have been impacted by her the way they should have been. So as God, I need to be positioned. And listen to me. I'm going to say something. I am over loyalty, false loyalty. I'm over false loyalty. Because we say, I can't do this because if I do that, they'll be upset or I'm letting someone down. Danny and I had this conversation. But the false loyalty is, is false because it's not to Jesus. So while we continue to put other people, because I, I used to have this the discussion um, with a man who was the um, head of the Bible college at, at one of the major Bible colleges on the Gold Coast, I, and he knew it was time to go. He knew that his time of teaching, and this is some time ago, was up. He knew it. The grace had lifted. It was hard. But he continued to stay at the Bible college and he continued to teach because, do you know why? Because he's going to look after the students if, if I go. The person that God has called to look after the students after you've gone, that's who's going to look after them. But he thought it was right to put the sheep before the shepherd. You never put anyone, anything before Jesus Christ. So what God tells you to do, that's what you do. And, and we have loyalties. You know, we have loyalties at work. And we have loyalties to family. And we have loyalties to friends. And we have loyalties to situations where we think, well, I can't leave it now. Or it's not the right thing to do. But if the grace is not there, and Jesus has called you forward to move on, you have to move on. I'm hoping people will turn up next week. But you know what I'm saying? We have this, this, this loyalty because we think it's the right thing to do. But he, the Bible college teacher way back then, it was about 12 years ago, he was miserable. And because he was miserable having to go to Bible college, his students were miserable. I was miserable having to work with him. But when he suddenly let go and decided, you know what? Even if I can't see who's going to look after the students, I've got, to, I've got to obey God. Everything changed. He got the most amazing opening and opportunity in his life. Students got a teacher who was passionate about teaching because he wasn't dragging himself there because the grace had lifted. The other Bible college lecturers, oh, it was a bit easier to go to work today. You know, but the thing is, but we have these false loyalties. And I'm telling you, we're coming into a season and a time but the only loyalty that you can have first and foremost is Jesus Christ. What has he called you to do? What is his intent for your life? And it really doesn't matter if we make a mistake. It really doesn't matter if we make a mistake. As long as we're moving. Because if I park my car, it's not going anywhere. I can't steer it left or right. I can't move it forward. I can't reverse back. If I park my car, it's just stuck there. But if my car is moving, I can turn left, I can turn right, I can move forward, I can go backwards, I can park here, I can go there. So God needs us moving. And sometimes we're not quite sure which way to move. Take a little bit of time to get the peace established, but then take a step of faith. At some stage, we have to step out in faith, don't we? At some stage. We've got to say, you know what, God, I believe you've got this for me and, and I've put it off because I haven't seen how he's going to make it work. I've put it off because I don't know what to do. I've put it off because this is new territory. But you know what? I have got to give my life my all. 
We only have one life. We only have one life. Not as the Hare Krishna lady thought, we come back again and again and again. We have one life. <laughs> we have, I don't want to come back again till I get it right. I just have the one life, it's fine. But you know, but we have this one life, so why don't we give it our all? We sort of live. What's the word? Kind of. Oh, not not full go ahead, you know, not not turbocharged. In the comfort zone. It's not, you know, and, and I was so blessed to get a, a prophecy when I was in the States, and the, you know. I love my prophecies. The first one I ever got was, I see this big slab of concrete. <laughs> Thank you. And I see, you know, lying down and people walking all over you. <laughs> Seriously, that's a prophecy? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> and then I see you standing up and, and you're, you're a shield over people. And, I, and I'm thinking, oh, honestly, the woman next to me got handmaiden of the Lord. I get slab of concrete. <laughs> Seriously. And then the prophecy I get in America, the very first words out of the person's mouth. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Like, didn't even ease me into it. Didn't even just, just bang. You know, you've got to start getting comfortable being uncomfortable. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, seriously. Bit of, you know, having the back, bit of ego soothing, then we can get into it, but no, straight up front. But this, this is the thing, we've got to actually, we have one life. Give it everything you've got every day. And I'm not talking about works and I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about living your day for Jesus. I write at the top of my diary, today is a valuable day. I'll never get today back. So everything I do today must be for his glory. We've got to start thinking along those lines. We've got to live his original intent. These are the good works that it talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. The good works that were preordained for us before the beginning of time. That then releases, oops, that then releases an effectiveness. Who wants to be effective for the kingdom? An effectiveness. It releases promotion. It releases all sorts of wonderful things, but it makes us effective for the kingdom and it makes us effective in God's family. So these are the four things, really, that Ephesians releases to us. Very simple. Not massive in any way or anything like that. But every one of us have areas where we're not free. I know I am not the only one in the room. Every one of us has areas where we're not exactly as free as we want to be. So when we come to communion, when you get into the book of Ephesians, when you, when you get into Ephesians chapter 3, this is what God wants you to have. He wants you to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in your inner man. He wants you to experience the love of God in a way that you've never experienced before. It's width, it's breadth, it's length and height, depth. He wants you to experience that. He wants you to encounter that so that you're rooted and grounded in love. And then he wants you to um, be filled with all the fullness of God, which is actually Christ, because Christ is the fullness of God. So he wants you to have these things. Well, I don't want to read about it. I'm going to have them. I want to possess them. I want to experience it. I want to encounter God in that. So when I get into Ephesians chapter 3 and I see Paul's prayer, I'm saying, God, I want an encounter with the Holy Spirit that's going to strengthen my inner man. God, I want to experience your love. I want it to go beyond my understanding. I want it to go past any knowledge that I could possibly have. I want to experience the width of it, the, the height of it, the length of it, the depth of it. I want all. I want to be so rooted and grounded in love that nothing can shake it out of me. I want to experience this. And I want to be filled with all the fullness of God. So I put in your notes there, I'm not quite sure where it is. Um, in the notes there, it says in the prayer that, um, that you be rooted and grounded in love 
verse 18, so that you are able to comprehend with all the saints the width and length, the depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So what it's actually saying there is that if you don't have a revelation, you're not going to be able to walk in the fullness of it. Does that make sense? I just see where I've got it written down. Verse 18, understanding love opens doors of comprehension. Understanding love opens doors of revelation. So if you're not walking in revelation, if it's not making much sense, if things aren't coming together for you, then maybe what we need is a revelation and encounter to experience the love of God because that releases comprehension, releases revelation. God is training you up as an army. You're in Ecclesia, God's government upon the earth. It's time to take your position. It's time to know your weapons. It's time to take a stand. So in doing that, we need to be released from the bondage that each one of us have got, whether it's health, finances, unemployment, whether it's lack of clarity on vision, whether it's like, I don't know what I'm doing, where I'm going, I haven't got a clue. I'm not sure whether I'm called to this or called to that. That is all bondage. It's all under the curse. So what we do is we come to communion and we say, God, I'm coming to you and I'm taking this covenant meal and I am bringing the bondage that is over my life, the bondage of homelessness, the bondage of, of not having enough, the bondage of not being able to pay the bills, the bondage of, of lack of clarity, of lack of direction, of lack of guidance, whatever bondage it might be in your life, I am bringing it before you and I am laying it on the covenant table and by faith, I receive my redemption, I receive my deliverance, I receive my release, my rescue because of Jesus Christ, because of his shed blood, because of what he went through for me, I receive deliverance out of this situation. And I pray that you would realign me with my book so that I can live out your original intent for my life and be effective for your kingdom and be effective with my life. Yeah? So how about we take communion and then just worship God and if anybody wants prayer, um, there's people around, you know, I'll pray for you, Sharon and Logan, Carol, whoever you want, just Mark and Barbie, come and get prayer. But let's take communion first. Let's give it to him first. So I want you to have it settled in your heart when you come up for communion. Danielle, can you just come and play a song while we have communion, please, love? When you come up for communion, you, you bring that bondage to the covenant table and you lay it down in the covenant and you pick up your rescue, you pick up redemption, you pick up your deliverance and then you, you, you say, Father, I thank you that you now align me, you reposition me according to the original intent and your purpose for my life. Be effective for your kingdom. Did you want to say anything? Sharon? Nothing? Every now and again, feel, feel free now. <laughs> so let's, let's, so if you've got your, whatever it is that you want to release through this covenant meal, God, we come before you right now and each and every one of us carry a bondage in our heart and soul that we want to release to you. We've had enough. We're fed up. We're frustrated. We're over it. We feel hampered, we feel hamstrung, we feel restricted, limited, low down. We feel like we can't get a break, we feel like we can't break through. So God, we're going to bring this to you once and for all. We're laying it at the covenant table. We're releasing it into the covenant. And we receive, through the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, we receive deliverance. We receive release. We receive rescue. We receive redemption. We receive freedom. And we pray that you would cause us to realign with your original intent and purpose for our lives. So if we're in the wrong job, move us on. If we're in the wrong place, move us on. If we need to be turned around, turn us around. But whatever it might be, we want to be living the good works that you have programmed for us, prepared for us before the beginning of time. And then I pray 
pray, Father, that you would make us fruitful and effective for your kingdom. Fruitful and effective. presence and the power of God.